Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Delighted to have you. I've been following you for years on Instagram, and it's wonderful to get to chat with you. Before we dive into it, though, I like to start off the show by pulling some words of wisdom from the Happy Healthy Caregiver jar, and I want to get your thoughts on this. Okay. So it says, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. I love that quote. That's not the first time I've heard it. And I love it. And I I really believe that too, because in many ways, I feel like that's what I've been doing with my life, love and Alzheimer's. Perfect. I know it it is. I mean, because we can help other people, right? I know I have a similar journey, not with dementia, but with caregiving and helping to make someone's path a little bit easier is what motivates me to just get up and keep sharing and writing and and doing all the things. And so I, I feel like we have a lot in common that way. Yeah, it's definitely become my purpose. So I'm sure you can relate to that as well. Yes. Awesome. Well, I want to hear, I know some of your story, but I don't know all of it, which is what I'm excited about talking today, but share a little bit for those listeners that have not met you before a little bit about who you are in your caregiving story. Sure. Um, So my name is Lauren Dykovitz, and I am the creator of the Life, Love, and Alzheimer's blog, which I started back in 2014 uh, because my mom was suffering with Alzheimer's. So my mom was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's in 2010. At the time, she was 62, and I was only 25. Um, I was newly engaged, working my first full-time, like big girl job and dealing with this diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's, which at the time I knew nothing about Alzheimer's. I didn't know anyone who had it. I definitely didn't know anyone my age who had a parent who had it. Um, And so I had a really difficult time coping with it and coming to accept her diagnosis Um, After a few years, I was able to come to a place of acceptance, and it really, really happened when I started sharing my story with others, and that was through my blog, which um, led me to write two books um, and my blog, Life, Love, and Alzheimer's, where I just share my story, uh, lessons that I've learned, just different things that I've been through on the journey. Um, My mom did live with Alzheimer's for 10 years. And she passed in April of 2020. Um, And so now I'm on the other side of it, but still continuing to share things that I'm still learning about the journey and processing through it all and through the grief of everything. Wow. You have been through a lot. And unfortunately, but we both have another thing in common is that we lost our moms last year. My mom had passed in September and yours in April. So I had just actually... My previous podcast was with my sister because she was the primary caregiver for mom at the end, but adjusting to life after caregiving, which has been what you are doing now. What is, um, so many things I want to dive into, but let's start there. What, what is helping you adjust to life after caregiving? Yeah, it's definitely different. I mean, I was not my mom's full-time caregiver. I never was. I was a part-time caregiver off and on, um, throughout the years of her living with the um, disease. My dad was her full-time caregiver and she lived with him. So it's been a lot harder for him uh, adjusting to the afterlife. Um, But for myself, it's been um, just kind of having time to process everything because I feel like when you're going through it, you don't really have time to think about a lot of what you're going through. And so since my mom passed, it's been a lot of time to think about things and process it and just remembering things that happened over the the 10 years that she lived with the disease. But obviously writing is my big go-to thing that definitely um, it's very therapeutic for me. It helps me process things and sharing it with other people just multiplies that because you know, they can relate and it, it helps them to hear what I'm going through and that we're all kind of going through this together. So that's been a big thing for me um, with writing my second book, which I just published 
that was huge in processing and everything. Um, and just trying to take better care of myself and try to get to know myself a little bit more, a little bit better and figuring out what, what's next and, you know, who do I want to be and what kind of life do I want to live now that I'm on this other side? I think that's, that's a great synopsis. And I'm glad that I know when I had asked my sister at one point, she said, while you're living it and you mentioned this, it's, it's difficult to unpack it because you're almost afraid to unpack it because what if you just spiral down and end up in a, in a puddle of tears, like, and you've got to kind of keep going and, and I love that you've got this little bit of distance, kind of like what I had with my sister when she was primary caregiver, your dad being primary caregiver, is you have this perspective of being there and being available, but then also kind of pulling back and kind of seeing what would be helpful, what would be helpful for you and not to diminish because it's still been rough on all of everybody in the family has a different, uh, a different role in it. But I, I can ap appreciate that. When you were, you'd mentioned um, in your introduction that you were planning your wedding and all of that. What was that like for you, Lauren, when oh my gosh. mom <laughs> wasn't the typical mom of a, you know, mother of the bride? Yeah, it was very difficult. Um, I actually got engaged just a few days after we got the diagnosis for my mom. And I, I don't even remember what was going through my head at the time because there was just so much that I didn't understand and the uncertainty of what the future was going to look like and trying to deal with this diagnosis, but also planning my wedding. And my mom was 62 mm. and I was 25. So it was a lot of anger that this was happening. I was going through this. I'm being robbed of this. I don't get to have my mom here. Um, just a few years prior, my sister had gotten married and I saw how involved my mom was with planning her wedding. And, you know, she went and bought her the to be Mrs. Sweatshirt with the bedazzled, you know, all over it. And she, I didn't have anybody to buy me that I bought my own. And I just remember like feeling so sorry for myself because I'm online ordering my own sweatshirt. And like, I just felt really sorry for myself that I didn't have my mom there to do those things with me. And um, when we went dress shopping, you know, it, it wasn't what I expected. I wanted this great moment with her and but she didn't, she didn't even understand what we were doing or why we were there or that I was trying on a dress and I would try them on and ask her, what do you think? And it was just like no reaction from her. And it was devastating to me, um, especially because, like I said, a few years before, it was a totally different story when my sister got married. My mom was so involved. My mom and I threw her bridal shower. My mom and I um, helped, you know, to put together the bachelorette party night and just all these things that I didn't have any of that. And my, although my mom was newly diagnosed in very early stages of the disease, it was enough that she couldn't help with wedding planning. And I still wanted to try to include her as much as I could, but it was so difficult to do that. And so then if I would decide not to take her to an appointment or include her in some part of the planning, I felt so guilty for it. I felt so bad about it. And I also just felt so confused and upset at what I was losing with my mom and not having her there, but still trying to appreciate that she was physically there, that she would be at my wedding. And it was a lot, there was a lot going on and I didn't talk to anybody about it because I didn't think anybody could possibly understand what it was like. So that just kind of contributed to my suffering, just me not, not letting it out, not talking to anybody about it and just kind of keeping it in. And it was a very difficult year leading up um, to my wedding. So, yeah. If someone were going through that now, you know, whether it's a wedding or their first birth um, of a child and, and other events where moms are usually like all in, what would you say to the, those people now? Yeah, I think it's, you know, you have to find a balance of still trying to include your mom in that stuff because, you know, you do still want those memories. You do still, as long as assuming she's physically here, 
you do still want those memories and you do still want to include her as much as you can and make the most of it. But you also do need that motherly support or at least support from someone. And I think that's something that I did not have and I didn't I didn't reach out and try to have it. And I think it's okay to try to find that motherly support from someone else, whether it's your sister or your friend or an aunt or even your your mother-in-law or your soon-to-be mother-in-law or your sister-in-law, like just somebody else who can kind of provide that same motherly support for you. It's okay to get that from somewhere else and you shouldn't feel bad Mm -hmm. um, like you're betraying your own mom because you're not. And she, she would want you to have that support. If she can't be it for you, she would want you to have it from someone else and hands down. Yeah. I think, I think that's so, so true. Do you, would, did you at the time or, or do you now Lauren identify yourself as a young carer or like if somebody were in your situation, like what kind of things would they Google to, to find people like you and find other people that can support someone that's going on that journey at that age? Yeah, I think a lot of people identify as like a millennial caregiver, which I never really, I don't know what generation I'm in. I get so confused about it. I don't know if I'm a millennial or not, but in being in your 20s um, and going through that, you know, I wasn't a full-time caregiver, but I, I was still a caregiver. I was still part of it and I was still helping out a lot. I just didn't live with my mom and I wasn't in it every day. So I do think it's fair to call yourself a caregiver. There's different kinds of caregivers. Um, and so, you know, young, young adult dealing with Alzheimer's, um, caring for an aging parent, things like that are all things that, you know, I think are relative, you know, searches to mm-hmm. for yeah. information. I, I, I say that because I, you know, I didn't know seven years ago what I should be Googling. So what, where did you find support when you were needing it? I didn't really, which is really why I started my blog, because um, when my mom was diagnosed, it was in 2010. So like social media, Facebook, Instagram, all of that stuff wasn't what it is today. I don't even think Instagram was around at all yet. And Facebook, they didn't really have like the pages like they do now for everything. It was just a personal profile kind of thing. Um, And so I did Google it. I think I just looked up, you know, Alzheimer's or I don't even know that I knew the term early onset Alzheimer's. I don't don't even think I knew that, but all I found was the Alzheimer's Association website. And while they do have a lot of great information and resources, it wasn't really what I was looking for. I wanted someone like me that was going through it that I could identify with and relate to. And I, I don't know if it was out there at the time, I never found it. So mm-hmm. Once I, about three years into my mom's diagnosis, I actually did a team for a race, for a fundraiser for the Alzheimer's Association. And I needed a fundraise for the event. So I, first time ever posting about my mom's diagnosis on my Facebook page was for this team event that I was trying to fundraise for. And I got so much support from people and people that I had no idea were going through it or had been through it. And that kind of opened me up a little bit. And then about a year later was when I decided I'm going to start my blog. I'm going to start sharing my story and putting it out there because, you know, I wanted to be who I needed when I was younger, but I couldn't ever find that person. And I wanted to be that person for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like you're sharing my story in some ways, (laughs) Alzheimer's. Um, but we're like cut from the same cloth, uh, <laughs> and, and the writing was also very cathartic for me. And yeah. when you were talking about, you didn't even know about early onset Alzheimer's. One of the folks that I'd interviewed a few ex- episodes back was Pat Moffat, who has the, the film, I believe it's either on prime or Netflix, but I can link to it in the show notes, um, ice cream in the cupboard, which is all about early onset Alzheimer's and even just watching things like that, that didn't even exist or, yeah. You know, so it feels like, you know, there's a lot more, there's the show. I watched it on an airplane recently, the father with Anthony Hopkins who has, um, I didn't have early onset, but dementia. And I just feel like more of that is helping to inform, uh, everybody, more celebrities talking about it. So I'm excited that there's more and more resources coming. We know, 
we know we still have plenty of work to do because there's 53 million caregivers in just the US alone. And so they need, they need help. What I like, Lauren, too, is I love how you 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 really focus too on the emotional side of, yeah. of being of what it's like to go through this experience as a as a family member uh, and watching it with your mom. And so one of your recent Instagram posts. I'm just going to read here as it says, I am not afraid or ashamed to admit that I wish for my mom's death several times during her Alzheimer's battle. Doesn't mean I loved her any less. Doesn't mean I'm selfish. And it doesn't mean her death was any easier or less heartbreaking. It simply means I wanted her suffering to end. So I think, you know, people, people are afraid to like, kind of name those emotions and admit those things about you know, I would say, you know, mom's journey for, for us, you know, your prayers change and you just want people to just, you know, rest in peace and let everyone else kind of, um, get back to their lives so that they don't continue to fail and lose themselves. And it's a hard realization. Talk a little bit about that acceptance path for you. Like, what did that look like? Yeah, I think, you know, at a certain point, you just kind of realize that there's worse things than death. And what my mom was going through was far worse than death. And although I knew for sure I was going to miss my mom and I would be devastated, I already missed my mom. I was already devastated. And I had to watch her suffer. I had to watch my dad suffer. It was a collective suffering for my entire family. And it was brutal to go through that. And a reason I talk so much about the emotional stuff is because that's really what I have the experience in. I was not in the day to day, uh, you know, daily tasks of caring for my mom because I didn't live with her. There were times that I did do that, but my main major experience was just being, you know, part of this journey and, and still wanting to have a relationship with my mom, but how that really affected me emotionally so much so that I really stopped, you know, living my own life. And, you know, at some point you just kind of realize this is no kind of life for any of us. It's no life for my mom going through this, my dad taking care of her. And even my sister and I just feeling riddled with guilt at everything that we're doing. Just, we're just living our lives. We're just trying to live our lives, but we feel like we can't or shouldn't be doing that. And, you know, I think that's the case for a lot of people. Like, of course you love your loved one and you want to take care of them, but this is no life for you. It's no life for your loved one to be going through it. And it's okay to want that to end. It's okay to want it to be over with. And the first time that I ever kind of shared that, you know, admitted it, I guess you could say um, that I thought, you know, sometimes I wish she would just die. And it sounds so harsh, but if you get it, you get it. If you've been there, you get it. It's not harsh. It's not cruel. It's, it's completely validated and completely understandable that you would want the suffering to end for everyone and the situation to end. And of course, you're still going to be upset and devastated when it is over and you're going to miss your loved one. And it's going to be a lot of grief and everything like that, that comes with the death of someone you love. But it's, you know, it's wanting that suffering to be over and just wanting to put it behind you and kind of move, move toward the next thing. And it is so hard for people to admit that because, you feel like a bad person and you feel shame and everything, but I just want people to know that like, you don't, you shouldn't feel ashamed of that. I, I don't think there's a caregiver out there who hasn't had that thought and some might not ever admit it, but I don't believe anybody that says they've never had that thought. Like I just wish it would be over with. Yeah. And I think it's totally normal to feel that way. I think it's totally normal to feel that way too. And yeah, it's if we're if we're being honest with ourselves, there's a lot of things, right? That it's it's difficult sometimes to say out loud, but just naming what that is and and giving it a voice can just make you feel lighter and and breathe breathe a little easier. Yeah. And and that's where support is so helpful to get to find your group of people. You know, whether whether you get, find support through your faith community or an Alzheimer's 
um, group or daughterhood.org or, you know, certified caregiving consultant or a Facebook group, like whatever, but finding the people that are going to understand it and going to get it because there's no judgment when you're, when you're with the right group of people, there's no judgment about those things. And if you're getting judged, you're not in the right group of people and time time to break up and find something different. I agree. Yeah. (laughs) You've, you've mentioned your books that you've written two books, which is amazing about your experiences with Alzheimer's. Talk a little bit about the difference between the two books. Why would, why would someone want to pick up one book versus another? What kinds of things are you hoping they're going to get out of these? Yeah, my first book is really just the first half of my story. And then the second book is the second half of the story. So it's really just the continuation of it. Um, I wrote my first book called Learning to Weather the Storm, a story of life, love, and Alzheimer's. Uh, back, I wrote it back in 2015 um, and published it in 2017. So there was still a lot more of the story that I hadn't lived yet. And as I was living it, I knew that I would eventually share the second part of my story, the second part of our journey. Um, and so after my mom died, that was when I kind of said, okay, I've got to, you know, when, when I'm ready, I've got to share the rest of the story. And so I just finished that and published my second book called When Only Love Remains, Surviving My Mom's Battle with Early Onset Alzheimer's. So the two together um, just really tells the whole story from diagnosis to her death. And then even a little bit after her death, um, I always say, you know, the first book is probably better for someone who's in the beginning, um, or the early stages of it and, um, getting the diagnosis and just sort of dealing with the beginning of the disease. And then the second book is more of the, uh, you know, moderate to late stages and then the death. Um, and you don't have to read read the first book to read the second book, you can just pick up if that's where you're at in your journey, and you're looking for support and someone to resonate with, you can absolutely just pick up the second book and start from there. Um, But I just, you know, I really wanted to just share a really raw and honest and vulnerable account of my story and what I went through, what our family went through. Um, Of course, it's told from my memory and how I felt. And I can't share anyone else's story um, or anyone else's, you know, how they processed or dealt with it. But this is, this is my story. These are all things that happened, thoughts, feelings that I had, um, things that I would cringe writing because I felt really bad for thinking that or feeling that, or, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable to admit some of that, but I think it's very important because if we're not all sharing our stories and how we feel and things that we think during this disease, it's easy for every single one of us to feel alone, but we're not, none of us are alone. There are so many other people going through it. And if no one is sharing that stuff, then, you know, everyone will feel alone. But if we all start sharing it and you can say, yeah, me too. I felt that way. I've been through that. I understand. I mean, that's the best support that you can ask for when you're dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And share story sharing is a form of advocacy. So someone had turned me on to that and I'm like, really? And they're like, yes. I mean, the more you talk and share and and vulnerable, then the more products and services are being developed, the more, you know, our government is aware of, of what's needed in this caregiving community. And they need real faces to these things, not just, you know, facts and figures. Uh, so I appreciate anybody that's vulnerable and, and, and raw with it and really focuses on the emotional side they're, they're, I mean, also excited to see that there's a lot more people sharing their story. Mm-hmm. I know you are a part of All's Authors, which is a mm-hmm. partner for Happy Healthy Caregiver. And I love that there's one spot where all of the people who write about Alzheimer's um, from children's books and memoirs and how-to guides and everything in between, cooking for somebody with Alzheimer's, like it's all, there's a lot there that people can can benefit from by going to the, um, the All's Authors. So we'll We'll definitely link to that too. Um, Are you ready, Lauren, for the lightning round? Sure. Okay. Well, this is, I'm pulling out some, some prompts from, from my book, which is the just for you daily self-care journal. And my hope in sharing this with the world is that it would just be a way to remember who you are and try on different things and just put your 
intentions around daily self-care and just start thinking about it, not even necessarily doing it, but just thinking about it. Uh, and so I bookmarked a couple things in here. We'll see, see what we got. Um, okay, so this one, when you were young, you probably had a stuffed animal or security blanket. What items bring you comfort now? My dogs. <laughs> Yeah, it's still kind of caregiving, right? Like, I don't know about you, but recently we have two dogs. So you can hear some of them vocalizing in the background. Um, one of them is not quite a year old, mini golden doodle. She's not so mini though. Oh, and then a, a 10 year old Chinsu. <laughs> and she, the golden doodle has both of her legs shaved right now because she's had two IVs in the recent past. One for taking ibuprofen. Oh travel ibuprofen, um, which is horrible for a dog. And the other one, she ate my husband's razor and didn't get all four blades, but one blade, luckily oh. she's fine. But I do kind of feel like there's still some caregiving involved with dogs. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah, I haven't had anything like that with mine, knock on wood, but I have two black labs and they are my children. <laughs> They're my babies. And yeah, it is. They have like a whole routine and a whole schedule and like they're very much on that schedule and you have to stick to it. And yeah, it's definitely a lot of work at times taking care of, of the two of them. <laughs> Worth it though. The unconditional love and oh, yeah. you leave for five minutes and you come back and it's like, you know, there's nothing oh, yeah. like that nothing joy like of it. them seeing you <laughs> um, and magnified with two for sure. Yeah. Okay, next question is, what's something healthy that you enjoy that also feels like a treat? You broke up a little bit when you said that. Can you say it again? What's something healthy you enjoy that can also feel like a treat? Um, I guess the only thing I can really think of is running because um, I run like four to five days a week. And while that's really healthy and good for you and everything, it's also just like my me time and something that I really look forward to and just being outside and being healthy to be able to run, not being injured, not being sick or anything, and just getting outside and especially on like a beautiful day feels like a real treat to me. But I also know that it's it's really good for me to do it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think keep trying on stuff like you have until you find what your thing is. And then it does feel yeah. like a treat, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, next question is, what's something that you were afraid to do and did it anyway? Writing my books and starting my blog. I was so nervous about like putting these thoughts out there. It's one thing to kind of talk to a friend or someone, you know, but to put that out, I still get nervous sometimes when I'm posting something and I feel like, Oh, I hope people are understanding. I hope I don't get criticized or judged for saying this. And I just know that if I feel that way, it means I definitely have to publish that and put it out there because there's definitely someone else who feels that way and who's thinking that, and I don't want them to feel alone. Um, and so even if I'm afraid to admit that or write about that or put it out there publicly, it's something that I know I have to do because I've committed to it. And especially with writing my books, because there's, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of time to get that done. And you worry about how's it going to be received? And is anyone even going to buy this? Is anyone going to read it? And once you do it and you realize that people are reading it and people do love it, it's, it's so rewarding and um, it's just so necessary. And so I just think the more afraid I am to say something, it just means that I have to say it because I need to put it out there for somebody else to help them with what they're going through. Mm -hmm. So true. So true. I'm glad that you did. And that, you know, we can always get caught up in that self-talk and that inner voice, the imposter oh my syndrome. Gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Who am I to share this story? What makes me think, you know, think that I can do this. And it's like, if not me, then who, like someone's got to start yeah. this, this ball rolling and, and, and they may resonate with, with you more so than someone else that's even sharing something similar, but there's something about you that makes you easier to connect with. So I'm glad yeah. that you are, are doing that. 
All right, last question. How do you incorporate technology into your healthy habits? I think um, listening to podcasts that are health related, or I, I'm on like a self improvement, like deep dive. And I listen to like a ton of podcasts about like self development and self improvement. And, you know, I think it's great because you can listen to it while you're doing other things, whether it's running or folding laundry or, you know, cleaning or cooking dinner or whatever things that you're going to be doing anyway, you can also listen to something that is helpful that will kind of guide you on the right path or make you feel better um, and help you to stay focused and get organized about your goals or what you want to do with your life or just how you want to take care of yourself. And so, I mean, I, li I listen to tons of podcasts. I listen to several of them every day, um, more so I think than I watch TV or read books or anything like that. And so that's definitely probably my go-to technology mm -hmm. to to listen to that. And it's my, you know, self-care. I think for a, a platform for caregivers, obviously they're listening to this one. So if they're, yeah. if they're hearing that, so it's, it's a great, you'd mentioned like the two fur things, I call it like a buy yeah. one, get one with the folding laundry or, or taking a walk and those kinds of things to, to work that in and integrate your self-care is, is so important. Plus you're consuming, um, the topics that are helping you uh, you know, maybe you're getting ideas to try new things. Maybe you're feeling uplifted. Is there a certain podcast where if it comes up in your queue, you are just like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad there's another episode of this. Well, my favorite one is Juicy Scoop with Heather McDonald, but <laughs> that's I don't know that one. <laughs> that's an entertainment one all about the Juicy Scoop. Um, so that's definitely like my favorite podcast. I listen to every single, you know, every episode that she has. I have a few others that I listen to. Um, I recently started listening to one called the adversity advantage, mm. um, which is really helpful. It's, you know, kind of like what, what I try to do with turning my adversity of going through this with my mom into an advantage by helping other people through their problems and, and uh, the diagnosis and everything. And so he talks to a lot of people who have been through something and kind of how they, you know, have turned it into a, I don't, a positive, uh, you know, I don't think Alzheimer's was a positive thing in my life, but at the same time, you know, I wouldn't be who I am today without it. I wouldn't be where I am today without it. I wouldn't be writing books without it. Um, and so it's, it's making kind of taking it to your advantage to get your life, you know, where you want it to be. And he has a lot of inspiring um, interviews and people on there. So I really enjoy that. Um, but uh, I listen to so many, like so many. Those are many, good. So. Well, we'll, we'll link to those for sure. And then before I have you kind of close out and where people can connect, I've been talking with you and if we, we provide the option when available to, for people to go on YouTube and watch the watch the conversation with us. If you yeah. want to see our faces, that's an option, but you have the most amazing artwork behind you. Yeah, I know if you what can, can you, um, yeah, can, there you, you go. Can still see it. <laughs> Love you mom. XO is what it says for those just listening. And it's in this cute round, um, the wooden frame, but where I, I love gift ideas like that, that bring, bring our loved ones back into our reality. Um, Talk about how you how you got this gift. Yeah, um, so the sign there is a gift from my husband this past Christmas, my first Christmas um, without my mom. And that's actually her handwriting. It was written on a card, um, I think from my high school graduation or something. I have it on this necklace here as well, the same thing, same handwriting. Um, my sister got me this last I think it was for Mother's Day, our first Mother's Day without our mom, she uh, gave me this necklace. And so the handwriting is my mom's handwriting and it's from the card, which was back long time before she had Alzheimer's. And anyone who has a loved one with Alzheimer's knows how much their handwriting changes. Um, and if somebody doesn't know that, then I'll tell you now that their handwriting completely changes. It's because, you know, just as they're forgetting how to speak and their words and their language, they're also forgetting how to communicate that in writing and how to write 
how to spell a word, how to write a word, how to write a letter. How do you write the letter E? You know, they don't know. Um, and so my mom's handwriting changed drastically um, from, from early on in her disease. I mean, even in the first, and could be, there's vision issues and things too that can also, you know, contribute to that. Um, so her handwriting started declining very early on in her disease. And then as it goes on, it only gets worse and worse until, you know, it sort of ends up as a little scribble and then can't write anything at all anymore and then can't hold a pen anymore and then just doesn't understand the concept of writing anything down at all. Um, and so I never realized how precious my mom's handwriting was until I lost it. I lost you know, that her writing me a note or writing, signing a card. Um, my mom was always the one, this is a little sidebar, but <laughs> my mom was always the one who bought all the cards and signed all the cards and signed my dad's name as well. And, you know, she would give us a card for everything. I mean, it could be a, a Tuesday and she would be like, happy mm -hmm. Tuesday, you know, like here's a card and every holiday, everything, she would send us um, cards or give us cards and always took such care in picking them out and signing her name, my dad's name and everything. And at some point that role reversed and, you know, my dad started doing that. My dad had to be the one. It went from her buying the cards to my dad taking her to the store to buy the cards or then helping her pick the cards out. And then that fully transitioned to him having to be the one to go to the store to pick out the cards and sign and have my mom sign. And then eventually my mom couldn't sign. I mean, I I've saved everything and it's heartbreaking um, to see the handwriting. I should compile it all um, and do a, a photo of the stages because mm -hmm. it went from being barely, you know, a little bit messy and then it was barely legible and then it wasn't even words. And then it was just scribbles. And then my dad signing for her because she couldn't, my dad still signs for her today even though she's not here, he'll still say, you know, love mom and dad. Um, and, and so I think it was, it might've been later on in her disease or maybe even after she passed that I was desperate to find something with her old handwriting on it. And I had saved so much stuff and I'm like, well, I want to go way back because even a couple years before her diagnosis, I could see the change and I could see we started noticing symptoms. And so I felt like it was still tainted with the disease. Um, so I went far back, wanted to go far as far back as I could. And I found this card from my high school graduation. And I said, well, okay, she definitely was, was fine back then. I know she was fine. Nothing was affecting her cognitively. And I found this card um, and that's her signature. She always wrote, love you, mom. And I saved it and I did, um, I think I just printed it out or something for my sister um, for Mother's Day one year. Uh, my sister held on to it and that's how we got the necklace and the sign and everything. And I mean, it's such a great gift for someone because it is so personal and it is like, this is my mom. And when I wear this necklace, I feel like she's with me and I sit here and I have her handwriting there. I also have a, a big portrait of her um, on the wall behind my computer. And so she's my inspiration for everything that I do. So, you know, it's, it's having her here with me just kind of motivates me to keep going. So it's definitely a great gift for any, any occasion at all. I mean, anything, if, you know, you've lost a loved one or if they're just sick and not, you know, capable of writing you a note or signing something or, and I save everyone's handwriting now. <laughs> Yeah, I have no you just never cards know. from like everyone. <laughs> and and also the, the the voicemails. I I have some old voicemails that I I treasure. Uh and I know you said both of those items, the necklace and the wall art came from Etsy and we'll definitely uh try to find a link to that to put in the show notes and I'm sure there's multiple options of people who yeah. take hand handwriting and do different gifts, but that's that's a very personal creative thing and I'm I love that you've surrounded your office space with things that are inspiring you. Yeah. Gorgeous. What, um, how do people connect with you? What's, what's the best place for them to find out? And is there anything else that you wish we had spoke about and shared and that we cannot stop this podcast until, until you share it? 
Um, so I'm life, love and Alzheimer's on, uh, everything. My blog is life, love and Alzheimer's.com. I'm on Facebook, life, love and Alzheimer's and Instagram at life, love and Alzheimer's. Those are the best places to find me, um, through my blog. You can find all of that stuff. You can sign up for my mailing list. You can, um, subscribe to my blog, um, and, find, you know, all the information you can email me on there and everything. Um, so, and that's pretty much it. I have a Twitter at Lauren Dykovitz, but I'm not really active on there. I'm pretty much on Facebook and Instagram all the time. And then both of my books are available on Amazon and you can just search my name to find both of those will pop up if you search my name. So, and we'll, we'll link as well in the, in the show notes page for, for all of that. Any, any parting words of wisdom? I mean, just, just keep showing up because it's so hard and it's always going to be hard. And no matter what level of support or what you have, you know, going through this, it's, it's going to be hard. There's nothing that's going to make it not hard, but you can still have a beautiful relationship with your loved one. You can still have unconditional love and the bond with them. So just keep showing up and be open to it and cherish the time that you have left because, you know, when it's over, it's over. And even though it was as hard as it was, you're going to miss it someday. So just hang in there and keep showing up for your loved one and for yourself and do the best you can and try to let go of all the rest. Well, well well-spoken words, Lauren. Thank you for showing up today for the podcast. I appreciate the conversation we've had today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really nice to talk.